welcome everyone who's watching right now. Um, thank you for joining us. If you haven't noticed, I've got a bit of a cold, so I apologize if my voice isn't uh, its beautiful, sultry sound usual as usual. <laughs> um, but with us live right now is Eugene, Eugene Garrity, who you've worked on some of the best films of the last 30 or 40 years. So before we open things up for, for listeners and watchers, um, I guess, give us a sense of what's going on on your end in terms of sound and uh, the quarantine and what's happening with COVID-19. Yeah, uh, Gordon, um, definitely some of the projects that I was uh, slated to start have been pushed back. Uh, initially, it was a 10 week and that was back in February when we didn't know anything when New York didn't explode yet. So I would say uh, it's gonna be, um, it's going to come back strong. I think there's going to be a lot of production up and running when things get better. Uh, for me personally, it's been a little rough, um, though I'm very fortunate to uh, be working, uh, helping Terry Malick on his next film. And it's truly an honor to, to work with uh, one of my film director idols that I just, you know, think is a true artist working and uh so that's been exciting um i can't talk about the project but uh, uh it's 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 been great because i've been helping them with their their rough cut it's just sound so they can help them edit the picture it's it's not necessarily going to be in the final but it's just really just a like temp music in a way now while you're in quarantine um what would you say do you have what's your go-to hobby to relax i guess you could say because there's a lot of people who aren't able to work right now and they need things to do so what do you do ah it's a good question um i'm a little embarrassed because it's it could be uh survivor's guilt uh where i'm living we were having a spectacular spring um so the weather is beautiful i'm in a community where we uh walk the dog um and I'm telling, you know, I'm really embarrassed to say I go up to the to the golf the driving range and hit golf balls and uh, play rounds of golf uh, in the late afternoon. And uh, <laughs> my golf game's getting a little better. <laughs> um, um, uh, so, yeah, uh, that's sort of my go to hobby only because I'm kind of uh, naturally addicted to that. Uh, that type of golf is like, com you know, compulsive. Uh, short of that, uh, uh, fly fishing for sure. Out, out back, I'm, um, I'm on my boat as much as I can. Wow. Now, um, in, you've worked on so many projects mm -hmm. that are iconic, but can you tell me what scene has challenged you in your career the most that you're most proud of? Uh, I would say... Uh, wow. Uh, I would say Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, uh, the the scene in the bamboo forest towards the end when they have their fight, their sword fight. Mm -hmm. There's something about that movie that was so uh, innocent uh, in in our uh, approach to it. I, I was really, it found me, you know, the sounds found us, uh, mm -hmm. I think. Because, you know, looking back in retrospect, uh, it's like, really? You know, uh, I'm not that smart. <laughs> and here, here, wonderful things happen. So uh, that's just catching me off guard. I, 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 there's something about that movie that was so innocent. And Ang's career and my career were just starting um, up in a big way. And, and um, it, it was... A wonderful he working with him was challenging on it he was very demanding on that film and um and uh so the entire film in itself was quite demanding and challenging but coming up with the green destiny i think was the most challenging um and at the same time the easiest if you go figure that you know <laughs> um so let's open this up to some of the listeners here um i'll just see if jason's found anyone here Okay. See what, if anyone has any questions, let us know. Um, in the meantime, um, so 
Now, when you and I chatted before in the course that we created, um, we discussed a bit about sa uh, surround sound design. Um, <clears throat> and some people have asked a few questions about surround sound in that course. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you go about developing your own sounds for surround sound? And how do you, not, not only mic, but how do you figure out what sounds work best in, in which channel? Yeah. Um, whenever there's an, I don't own a multi-channel mic or rig personally, but uh, whenever there's an opportunity to record multi-channel, obviously that's a good start. Um, I personally don't like handling um, 5.1 or 7.1 files in Pro Tools using Spanner as a way to, to uh, change things. Um, I guess starting out when 5.1 was really the big deal, discrete, anything discrete was a, a quantum leap forward for sound designers from the original Dolby format. Um, and multi-track recordings weren't really the thing to do back then, even though I had friends that would set up two DAT machines with two uh, space pairs and do quad recordings. I always found it to be an opportunity to create the atmosphere with multiple mono elements uh, and sometimes stereo elements. In a way, the, the per perfect 5-1 uh, experience is, is really a sweet spot in that theater or in the mix stage to get whatever uh, spatiality of a single source recording would be, say of a forest pine tree wind. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, the opportunity to 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 use multiple elements and mix them uh, into a pre dub of 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 a, of a five one or seven one or at most um, wind pre dub say it's just an opportunity to use multiple elements to uh, move things around a little more uh, but again, you could use that and have a multi channel recording bed to start with um, use it almost like like the glue to hold it all together. Uh, so we have a question here from someone and they were like, can you explain what your process is? Um, and so I'm not too sure if they mean for recording or if they mean for designing sound. So why don't we start with uh, for a film, designing designing sound for a film? Yeah, um, definitely uh, reading the script would be the very first thing. And then uh, making up a list of known things we have to record for that movie because they just don't exist we need new stuff uh so it all starts kind of there of the um what what elements or what materials are we going to need to to record and and uh of course my brain starts working about what, what what's the overall sound of the film but i honestly don't know at that point i'd love to tell you that i have it all figured out but it 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 rarely you know you ho you start with an idea and it it, it takes you, you go down a path and you know, we've talked about this, you know, in the case of like Fargo and this, you know, that sound design sort of developed, you know, in between Joel Cohen, Skip, let's say, and me. And, and it's just uh, it, that that was none of that was thought up initially. It just kind of said, oh, yeah, what, why don't we try this? So the process can be, uh, kind of, you know, vague uh, to start with. But um, it is with starting with the script for sure. And then collecting sounds. Uh, getting feedback from a spotting session with the director and then going off and experimenting. And, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I accidentally bumped my mic there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so another person wants to know, uh, do you personally mix all your tracks or if, and I'm assuming that's within the sound that you've designed. I pre-mix everything personally. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, uh, whenever I'm uh, editing sound effects, backgrounds, uh, I do usually those together and then I get the Foley. So while I'm designing effects or cutting sound effects, uh, I'm naturally putting reverb on things, uh, putting them in a space, panning them. So all that's kind of quite, you know, pre-dubbing the elements as I'm cutting. Uh, I get Foley, uh, I start pre-dubbing Foley against my backgrounds and my hard effects and come up with a new shape. And that'll either be uh, what we mix in the final or we'll go through another pre-dub process, like on Gemini Man, uh, when I work with Doug Hempel, he, we then go into an Atmos pre-dub. So for two weeks, we take all my material that I've 
outside of sprinkled holy water on, and then we put it into a real Atmos pre-dub. Um, uh, we go through the process of, you know, creating objects. We'll, we'll actually we'll create objects uh, in and, uh, ahead of time. We'll kind of decide what we want to make an object when we get there, and that's part of the pre-dub process. Um, so but, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, but I oftentimes, uh, to be honest, I really love it when there's a, an effects mixer there. Uh, as uh, uh, in New York, that doesn't happen all the time, so I become the effects mixer often. And uh, I, I do feel with a, a, a lot of times with effects mixers, they can bring it to another level just by me not, be, not you know, uh, mothering it too much to death or let, let somebody else listen to it and make some decisions based on their, their ideas. So as you know, you know, it's so collaborative. It's, it's fun to, to sort of bounce things off each other um, when there's another mixer. And other times it's just me going with my tracks <laughs> and having the director tell us, you know, what, what's going on? Well, that was going to be one of my questions is um, how much dialogue between you and the mixer is there? Because you don't want to mix it down to a point where it's handed to the mixer and then they can't undo something or. Absolutely. Something. Yeah. Um, that's absolutely positively correct. And I don't know how many other guys work this way, but I'm, I would say 100% virtual. So there's nothing there that can't be unraveled in the sense that my pre-dubs are all uh, EQs are virtual, uh, reverbs are virtual. Uh, and in fact, I've had mixers say, you know, hey, you don't have to do that. If your door has four elements and it's the right sound uh, for the room, just make me, give me a stereo pair or LCR. Uh, but I do keep everything virtual. Just, I don't know why. I've just been doing it that way for so long. <laughs> Now I have a question from someone and they say, uh, does ADR play a big role in the movies that you've been working in on? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, would you say it's gotten more so since, cause you've started back when we were on, you know, two inch tape and, <laughs> or yeah, um, magnetic tape. 35 mag. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it depends. It, it really depends on the director. There's a lot of directors that simply don't like ADR. They know mm -hmm. it. It sounds fake. It doesn't even sound like production. And a lot of times they don't like production. They want it to sound out of body, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I do think it's a process like um, somewhere along the line, you know, directors uh, uh, or filmmakers decided there are, are a process on how to make a film and AD in post-production ADR and Foley are just one of those processes. Oh, well we get, yeah, we get loop group and we can have all these guys talking which is important because uh, you want to control that dialogue uh, for foreign distribution. Mm -hmm. um, you want that to be on the, you know, you re I almost go out of my way not to cut any backgrounds with discernible dialogue in it anymore. I just know that loop group's going to do it. Okay. Yeah. And now, now this one we, you and I've talked about before, but um, someone wants to know, how did you get into the field? Huh? Uh, well, uh, I got, I graduated with a, a audio engineering degree, uh, from Berkeley uh, uh, College of Music. And I went around looking to, uh, studios to look for a gig, you know, as an engineer and that wasn't going to happen in music. And, uh, you know, a sister's boyfriend, you know, looked in this film book in New York called the yellow book. That is, uh, a directory for filmmakers to gain access to, uh, uh, facilities and, and equipment. And he goes, yeah, you go over here and, you know, check out this place, Reeves. It's a big video facility. So I started in the mailroom and uh, then became a messenger. And they had a computer, one of the first computers in the world for sound. And I just, you know, latched onto it. It was like the, the coolest thing I ever saw. And uh, I got lucky. Now, when, as computers entered into the field, uh, did you immediately jump into Pro Tools or was there another software that you used? It definitely wasn't Pro Tools in the beginning for me, uh, and I came late to Pro Tools, uh, uh, kicking and screaming. The early version of Pro Tools, you didn't even have um, stereo yet. You had to like, you had to group mono element. And mono. It was just not really well thought out initially. It's it's fantastic now, and they've done a fantastic job in developing mm -hmm. it. Uh, I started so the computer I started on was the first of its kind. It was retrieving 8-bit 
um, mono files from hard disk. This is before Winchester technology, the, the idea of a, a hard drive, really. Uh, so this is going back. <laughs> uh, this would have been 82. And from there, I got really hooked on uh, New England Digital had this thing called the Synclavier. And sampling became a big thing uh, where you could record into RAM. And then you had the ability to process that with pitch and numerous other methods. And so the Synclavier became my, my hammer and, and net, you know, and chisel. It just was absolutely the tool. Uh, then we went to that to Sonic Solutions was another one for a while. Very cool uh, program. And, and, and uh, we really loved audio vision, which was yeah. uh, Avid's, uh, um, approach and uh, that was amazing. That really was the first disc-based editing system, I think, mm -hmm. that was that brought in the film and video editing concept to, to, to. It made sound part of the editing thing, not just an adjunct. Like the Synclavier was a musical instrument that I modified to to make work. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I loved audio vision. I love hearing the old, <laughs> like what software people started with in the 80s and 90s like um yeah. i have a friend who is an editor and he started on the montage editing system yes and it was he's like we had a room full of uh basically tape decks that were just yeah. ran and it was like, crazy yeah, yeah it was just and you hear all these yeah. crazy stories and yeah how things work. it's so funny and uh all that was because certain things were so expensive like for you to transfer your dailies to laser disc back in the day when Editroid was a concept in yeah. Lucas Films, I mean, it, it just, the process of transferring the dailies just, I think there were two places in the country that did it. And it was very prohibitive financially. Uh, <laughs> so Montage comes along with like 15 beta, Sony Betamax and has the exact same data on all of them, and but they're parked randomly in different <laughs> locations. So the time to access it is hopefully like short. I mean, that's, kooky <laughs> and uh yeah. it was used to great effect andy manchin in new york cut many films with that well you know what's funny is i was at an event once and i just happened to be seated beside a guy who worked on the edit droid and he told me that i was like oh you gotta tell me all about the edit droid <laughs> and uh and then i was like so what's happened like did, did any of them survive and he's like oh when we decided to fold everything up we just tossed them all in the in the bay yeah. in san francisco yeah. and i was like what so yeah. there's edit droids just sitting at the bottom of the bay can you imagine um yeah and again i i don't even know what that format was if it was laser disc or uh now when i i said it uh it was before winchester stack technology actually the system i worked on used uh four 200 200 megabytes uh drives and they were layered discs that had um sound heads go between the layers it is a winchester technology it just wasn't sealed these were removable disc packs they were enormous the drive the machine that drove the the disc at 3600 rpms was the size of a a, a dishwasher even bigger and so we had four of those for sound playback in the room and i could retrieve audio off that and mix it and change pitch and with vca uh, uh i could control eq and volume and I could do that to picture. So it was really pretty cool in 1982 to be able to, to mess around with that. Yeah. Now I have a question here and you and I've talked about this, but can you recommend any films that blows you away for its sound work? Oh, so many. Yeah. So many. Um, from the, from the minimalists, you know, uh, you know, days of heaven. I was, you know, just because, uh, you know, in seeing that movie again for the first time in so many years, now that I'm working with Terry Malick, I mean, the Thrasher sound effect in that that is used as a uh, as a motif is it's just fantastic. To the most, you know, complex film sounds uh, of currently today, I, you know, uh, Road Warrior, Mark Mangini's work. On the on the remake and mm -hmm. uh, so many of my my uh, colleagues uh, produce such great work. Uh, lo love Full Metal Jacket um, as a very austere uh, soundtrack. Uh, uh, gosh, um, 
uh, Barton Fink always comes to mind uh, with the bell and and, yeah. and, 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 and and the fly and Skip's work is so so special. Uh, yeah, I apologize to, to the folks I haven't mentioned that have done some of the greatest films, at, you know, sounding films. Um, and lately, I really dug. I, I loved Baby Driver recently. I was really a lot went of fun. with that. Yeah. yeah, those guys did a great job. And uh, I, I, I'm not entirely sure how they did it, but given the opportunity to cut picture to sound or how it all worked, it it it, it really had a very good effect on this telling uh, the story. I thought it was wonderful. Um, I it it's funny because I've always wondered which do you prefer to work on? Do you prefer to work on sort of like uh, something that's big and grandiose, so like explosions and, and things like it, scene that might be highly active? Or do you prefer to work on more subtle things where you can really work with the character of the, the sounds? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Uh, you know, again, uh, folks on the East Coast, New Yorkers in general, we don't get really big sound jobs like, uh, like the Marvel films in LA. Um, I would say I'd rather shy away from those type films. They're just too much work. And, and, uh, and in, in the grand scheme of things, the, the way sound works in that, in those films is, is a very big challenge with the amount of music. Uh, I would say, uh, I would just like anything that there might've been a moment in that film that sound played a role in the character to, and it, it, you actually kind of remember it from from hearing it later or seeing it later. Uh, those are pretty cool. But, you know, in general, uh, I just like, regardless of the sound, it's, it's the story and, you know, the people you're working with, you know, those, those really mean a lot. I'm blessed with being part of great films over the last 30 some odd years. And um, th that's really a wonderful thing. I, if they didn't even sound good, it wouldn't matter. Those are wonderful films to be a part of. And some of them sound pretty good. And it's crazy because I remember talking to Dan Liebenthal, who was the editor on Iron Man and a bunch of the mm -hmm. films. I remember him saying, I think it was Iron Man 2. I can't remember which film, but they were still getting VFX shots in the mix, yeah. which I can't imagine not only from an editorial perspective, but also from a sound perspective that the visuals could change on you, which could change yeah. the perspective, which would scare me. Completely. Oh yeah, it's awful. And we, we, we get visual effects updates right up until the printmaster. And it's freaking. Uh, yeah. I've, I've told this story before on Hulk, there would be an avalanche or rocks tumbling down a, a, a mountain and we'd, you know, foley that and get all the foley, put it in sync. And then the visual update it would be completely different. Like, I, and, and it's like, why would that be just three frames off, you know? And then that shot's 10 frames off. And it wasn't like the whole thing was shifted. <laughs> That's like your worst nightmare is, is resyncing stuff that was very hard to, pre, to, to, fight, to mix and then having to cut it and move it and hope it all works. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, a really sad part of the process that visual effects come in so late. Uh, I know in the future producers will make budgets or in schedules that that will change. I, I, I know it because it's so inefficient. <laughs> so I got a question here and they're wanting to know, um, what are your thoughts? And I don't know too much about this myself because I just sort of saw headlines, but uh, what are your thoughts about combining the Oscar sound categories? I'm not sure what's happening with that. Yeah, uh, it just happened that they combined uh, the two uh, ca categories, mixing and editing into one. Uh, I was extremely happy about that. I was, um, I've been a proponent of, that, proponent of combining the awards for a very, very long time. And again, it makes sense for a, a New Yorker to say that or East Coast guy because those disciplines were so severely, are very much regulated or were in Hollywood to, to such great degree that it made sense for them to be two different things. But you know, a guy like me or other people, they get some sound, they start to mix it together, they're editing and mixing at the same time. It's like that line's now completely blurred. And um, I don't know what it will mean. I, I think it's a benefit for the people watching the show and the Academy voters. Uh, 
that now have to scratch their head and goes, well, what is sound editing versus sound mixing? What, I guess I'll just check them off, you know, whatever. It, uh, so I always supported that and I'm glad it happened. I'm sure there's a lot of folks that aren't uh, as glad as me, but uh, I just, why so detailed oriented, you know? Uh, it's all, you know, it's all the soundtrack ultimately and, and it's hard to, to sit, to differentiate between those disciplines. Well, it's it gone are the days where you have, if I remember correctly, um, you know, like your music mixer, your dialogue mixer, and your effects mixers all working simultaneously to the mag track. Right. Right? Yeah, even even with a multi mixer setup, which they have, of course, in uh, all the time, uh, more times than not, you're rarely working together because you're answering. You know it. it you're 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 probably after a playback the director has notes so you go in and get those notes you know and um uh but to have each individual there with those uh disciplines be available to take over and do their part i i think that's great um and uh there is something to be said about wingmen and a head mixer I, I find it rare these days to see three mixers where the music is is generally, at least in New York, handled by the dialogue mixer. Yeah. And the wingman will be effects and foley type thing. Well, when I started, I, I started as an assistant at a sound post sound place. And, uh -huh. um, one of the sound guys was just giving me books. It was like, teach yourself sound. Yeah. And one of his books was broke down like the multi-mixer thing and it was like that's how mixing is done because it was done in la and that's how it's been done for years and then i got to go to my first mix i'm like where are all the mixers <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's changed <laughs> radically and um i don't know what the future is going to look like but again you know if you if you want to streamline the storytelling process or making the story, it's wonderful to do it with, say, a red camera versus, you know, uh, a big Arriflex, you know, in terms of efficiency and economics. So that trickles down throughout the whole thing. The next thing you know, you're mixing a motion picture of a walk and talk of a, you know, of a, a drama. And it's, it's one guy in a room and he's got four elements he's mixing. And, um, it's it makes sense to to do that efficiently uh it's it's a very it, it, it's going in a, in a direction i think that only makes sense across all the all the the industry's disciplines if if it was easy to light a set you they'd be doing it you know quickly uh if, it, if things take time still and uh for one person to be in charge of all the sound isn't isn't uh, um necessarily a bad thing um i personally like the idea that it's split up and was still a group doing it together. Uh, I think that the flow of ideas is superior because you're, you know, you're not your own judge and jury. People have feedback and you, you react to that feedback and you change things. I, I, I love being with a group myself. Uh, that said, I love pre-dubbing by myself and getting it to the point where I say, well, this is what I'd like to start with mm -hmm. uh, because you should have heard it before. <laughs> you know, uh, I got it to this point. I'm very happy to, present this now let's make a movie with this stuff you know um so <laughs> this is a fun question and it's completely out of your control <laughs> um and i i'm assuming this person's asking this angrily why do why do trailers sound exactly the same <laughs> yeah yeah well trailers you know it's it's sort of like everything else, you know. Their job is to sell that movie and to make it interesting to to watch. Uh, I think not, they do. You're it. not involved in the trailer sound, right? Like Almost never. Uh, yeah. The closest thing we've come is I'll give them some sound effects, but it's a. In fact, the director's not involved. Nobody's. You know, it's a, compl a completely separate arm. Mm -hmm. uh and the director gets approval uh and some you know i don't know to what degree they can go back and they kind of everybody kind of throws their hands up and says okay you know it's good enough or whatever and the sound is going to be what you would expect you know whiz bangs and explosions and and you know cool stuff actually i think it's great uh um but they do tend to follow a formula and that formula is sort of has been repeated quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to do it. I, I wouldn't know how to do a trailer without going that in a world. 
things <laughs> and, and and come up with the you know it's gotta it's gotta be there right <laughs> no this is sort of the same vein but like uh for a while there there was a lot of talk about how cds have no dynamics do you find that uh with trailers or do you find cds that like, you mean yeah like like a lot of that like a lot of bands were mixing it so there was not a huge dynamics for a while Oh, yeah, well, that is a technique in rock, say, uh, yeah. or various things uh, where uh, they, yeah, they, they, uh, they restrict the dynamic range to get a really nice tight sound that might play really well on car speakers uh, or various things. Uh, I haven't seen that too much with sound for movies. And it is challenging. I mean, there are times when things get, I mean, we do have this extended headroom now and, yeah. you know, 100, 110 dB, 100, you know, that's a lot of, a lot, a lot of sound at 85 SPLs that can, you know, knock you back. Uh, and then of course it can go down to very, very quiet of like, what's he saying? So I, I don't know uh, if there's any of that effect on say the DVD market for home theater or whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm not technically aware of that, but we keep, to best my knowledge, our we keep our frequency response. I mean, our our dynamic range wide open, um, with the obvious limiting compressing, yeah. obvious. But it's not like we're we're now taking that and squashing it down like a a really good pop song, you know, or something like that. Is there a moment that you would say is uh, one of your favorite moments that you've experienced in the theater with sound? It doesn't have to be your film; it could be anyone's film. Oh yeah. <laughs> The tiger in Apocalypse Now, man, jumping out at uh, when they go to collect the mangoes. I mean, that just holy smokes. <laughs> that one, um, in Thin Red Line, the there was a red laser tracer used on one bullet, I think, uh, somewhere in the uh, in the movie, and I remember seeing that in the theater and just that effect of the red line coming out of it. I, I don't know what it was, but I think that one was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, I remember there was, oh, what was that? 28 Days Later or whatever, 28 Weeks Later maybe it was the sequel. Uh huh. There was a moment where I guess the zombies broke out of something and started running at everyone. And the soldiers had them all on uh, in their infrared or night vision. Uh, and all you could hear was the soldiers trying to figure out who to pick off. Right. like they couldn't tell who was a, not a zombie and i thought zombie. that was so like there was no yeah. zombie sounds it was just them on the things yeah. like which one to shoot which what what do we do and i remember right. that in the theater being blown away by that like that huh, that's interesting. yeah yeah uh i actually worked on a film where that was part of a training exercise for these uh this special team of assassins assassin usa or something uh, it was michael keaton it was a few years yeah. ago i have no idea what happened to that movie but one of the training sequences is uh you don't know who's a terrorist or not and mm. they're you, they're in a dark room with the glasses there's flashing and you have to make quick decisions on who to kill and and who not uh but um and i'm sure there's others uh but the one in apocalypse just is always a natural one to come back to because it just jumps out at you, you know, uh, and scares you uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, in, a, in a big way. <laughs> now, I have someone here who wants to know about the Irishman. And uh, they want to know, what was the workflow like due to the Irishman's uh, heavy use of the effects, especially the de-aging and what have you? Well, in, in, that's, a, that's a really good question. Well, the de-aging, the picture department actually took time off. They uh, had finished a cut and then had to sort of uh, wait for the de-aging process to, to finish. Um, for me personally, I did a lot of uh, work. Uh, uh, I, none of the scenes I worked on had a de-aging um, element that affected my the sound effects, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the shots I saw of the characters, they might have the dots on them for, uh, for uh, the, the process. Uh, but that workflow flow was very similar to the way I work with Marty and Thelma, which is they, uh, early on I get a script. Uh, they generally have a shopping list of things they need while they cut to help them cut uh, to make decisions with the picture uh, or to then screen and have a you know a reasonable mix, uh, temp mix of, with some sound effects that are 
really important emotionally to to tell the story. And that's how I did that. So I would say all the effects we did that were really important in the movie that you hear in the final soundtrack were already developed before the, the you know, through the, before the sound crew even came on. I was oh, working wow. with my assistant, you know, say. Oh, wow. Now, yeah. um, someone here, um, and I don't know if you know this person, but they say this is a guy named David Bolton. And he says, I that's know, David, it's always fun to hear you wax poetically. <laughs> well, David, I, 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 I always like hearing your, uh, your stories too, uh, <laughs> especially with your New York, New Jersey accent that is just so beautiful. Um, uh, and um, thanks for chiming in. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you ever go to the audience previews uh, of the film and see how they react to the sounds? Uh, y yes. Uh, sometimes they want bodies in there uh, for their previews, and those will be, uh, you know, note-taking focus group type previews. Uh, sometimes I've been asked early on back in the day, you were asked often to go to a preview to see where the, to take notes, or they wanted me to record it or something, where they could hear the audience laughter and know how to re-edit the film for pauses or stuff like that, mm -hmm. where unexpected laughter uh, might have ruined the line of dialogue, so they'll open up a shot. But the, I, you know, I don't think that's sound guys do that anymore. Uh, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, definitely want to see see what the movie's going to be like. You know, uh, see it on a big screen. Uh, mm -hmm. Any screening ahead of time is helpful to the process of, of, of creating. Wow. Now. Um... To jump, what what would you say is the film that you've worked on that you're most proud of? Uh, uh, um, <laughs> well, and if you, you know, if you can't if you can't uh, choose, you can give us a couple because we don't want to get anyone in trouble. Yeah, you don't want to get any. You'll get me in trouble <laughs> um, for sure if I start uh, seeing who my favorite child is. I mean, obviously, Hugo was great because of the the accolades. Um, that was a real wonderful experience from beginning to end. The movie, the sound we had the opportunity to do in the movie, and then the the acclaim that came with it was really, you know, really great. <laughs> um, again, I go back to Crouching Tiger. I'm extremely proud of the work done there. Uh, and... Life of Pi. Um, I was kind of disappointed that we weren't recognized as much as I thought we were uh, uh, should have been, and I think a large part of that was because it was very accurate. You know, the the, the visuals were so amazing. I mean, ninety eight percent of that 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 was not a tiger. You know, that's mm -hmm. all nine, tremendous amount just just simply didn't exist. And we did that with footsteps and 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 vocals and stuff. And I think everybody bought that that was a tiger. So what's the big deal? Yeah. <laughs> well, like I can't I can't remember when you did this, but you did a uh, an event where you did a presentation with um, I think it was Sight, Sound, and Story, where you showed the original recordings, and you you said there was a huge amount of ADR in that, if, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. So absolutely, like uh, for instance, the boat sinking. No, that's all wind machines on a set uh the, and so uh, pie yelling out all that stuff was all adr uh there was nothing usable whatsoever from stem to stern of that scene uh, mm -hmm. uh after he in fact it, it's it's so funny now that i remember it was the head of the reel so like a 12 feet on reel three he hears something uh off camera and gets up so from 12 foot to you know a double reel you know 18 minutes later or whatever how long the sequence was probably like more like eight or ten minutes that there wasn't a single production sound used and uh all the wind all the storm all all the waves uh the adr people yelling uh all the horse you know, all the animal sounds um yeah that was completely replaced now going back to what we talked about earlier with adr do you ever use that as an example when a director's like, no, I don't want to do ADR. And you're like, but you really need to do ADR. Here's an example. Yeah, of great. yeah of course. No, uh, directors will certainly use ADR uh, when they clearly hear it technically, it's a disaster. 
there was a scene in Aviator where it, uh, um, Leo's playing Howard Hughes, and he's he's shooting the scenes of the of the of the dog fights that he then will eventually go put sound to. And of course, it's all wind machine, and you know Leo's mm -hmm. saying some things, and it's like and, uh, nobody was going to use that, but somehow I got in the dialogue freed up. I'm like, why are we hearing all that? <laughs> the wind, no the the machine noise. But when it comes technical like that, um, that blatant, they'll 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 sign on for it. But it becomes like, hey, you know, this thing really sounds like crap because that airplane in the background. And the director will say, well, I really don't care. The emotional, I prefer the track better on production. It's just emotionally more satisfying. And they know better for that reason, for sure. Have you ever been, and this comes from an example someone showed me once, but uh, when, you, when you worked on lower budget projects, were you ever in a situation where they couldn't afford ADR and you had to figure out a workaround? I'd have to think. Um, certainly, there have been... Definitely, what we worked on films throughout our career that have been so low budget that that money's so tight that uh, they would use alternate takes, mm -hmm. or you would cheat. Um, um, I'm trying to think if we, you know, maybe took an actor into the cutting room and like rigged up a mic and recorded it right to mag. You know, um, I'm sure every which way was was thought through to do it to save money, but. Um, for the most parts, you know, later in my career, the, the budgets we've been working with, uh, the producers have, you know, have a line item. They're going to know they're going to need it. so much ADR. So they, they, they put that, that money in there for that. Mm -hmm. Cause I saw one at this demo. I saw once they, something was, I guess the dolly track was squeaking through the whole shot as the person was talking, but it was just low enough that they, and it was nighttime. So they built in a whole <laughs> background. Yeah. And Brilliant. It, good. Yeah. And it was really smart. Um, right. Someone wants to know how long do you have for your, uh, for sound work on an average film? How much time? Uh, let's say six weeks prep uh, from editing to, to uh, you know, six weeks, five weeks of editing and designing and then we'll start the pre-dub process which is usually a week on a, low, a lower budget or two weeks if you on a bigger budget and then the mix uh might run for two or three weeks um it depends really it, you know uh it's been a while since i had say two weeks to prep a film but it's doable you know depending on the, how complex they are uh and maybe a, a, a week to mix it and then you get like three or four days for deliverables, you know, to do the M&E, the printmaster, uh, and deliverables. But Irishman was longer. Uh, Gemini Man, I think I had like 12 weeks to edit, say, and uh, something like that, which is a lot. Yeah. Um, it depends. Uh, I, 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 I don't have a really... Uh, you know, my, my co-supervisor, Phil Stockton, would have that number right off the top of his head in terms of uh, average. Yeah. But I, it's kind of, I just, I'm thinking back on the various projects. Well, and this might tie in because you talked about Phil for a second there. But someone wants to know what percentage of your time uh, on a project is spent dealing with clients and administrative work, uh, like hiring people and dealing with budgets versus creative work, such as sound design and cutting effect, sound effects. Now, you and I both know this because we've discussed it, but... Yeah, uh, someone's interested in, in knowing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Philip, Phil Stockton and I share those responsibilities. They're sim surprisingly uh, finely delineated. You know, Phil definitely starts with a budget. He sends it to me, but it's, 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 it's his budget for the most part. I might tweak a few things for sound effects recording, say. Mm -hmm. uh, he... He does the hiring. Um, he'll suggest people if I need more effects editors just other than just myself. Um, and then spotting sessions, we'll both go to the spotting sessions. But at that point, it's more on me to keep the communication up with the editing department for creative reasons, say. It's his job to, to continue a very complex dialogue for booking ADR. He'll go to the ADR sessions. Uh, and that's probably true of most people I've co-supervised with. They're really 
you know, the sound supervisor on the more tech, on the more um, uh, official way. And I'm sort of the guy, well, it makes sense for me to handle that. A, it's just one less thing you got to worry about. And that is sort of my area of, of you know, knowledge, say. Um, and I know guys do it all by themselves. And I think those guys are incredible. And they, mm-hmm. that's very cool. Uh, I, you don't want me, you don't want me doing that stuff. <laughs> Now, I already know the answer to this one, because again, we've talked a lot, but <laughs> as a sound designer, how much do you get involved with the production sound? Uh, a lot, you know, in the sense that, uh, and you know, I I should have mentioned this when the earlier question was, what is my process? Uh, because what we do do is uh, go through all the production sound initially and get any usable track, any that, you know, a door open, a, 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 you know, the director says action, there's no dialogue in the scene. A guy walks in through, you know, down a hallway, opens a door and closes it and, and so on and so forth. Or a car starts and goes away or whatever. So we do, we, we, we build a database of all the production sync tracks and wild tracks. And we use those within the film. Uh, in other scenes, uh, it might, you know, one car action in one scene might, be better it's just better mic or just better sounding than the actual one that's in the scene so we might steal it from another scene uh that would you know any me personally would obviously have to deal with sound effects more than dialogue Mm -hmm. but we very much interact with production sound all the time now you've been more than generous with your time um and i always like to ask some kind of fun question to wrap things up (laughs) so now i asked you about the hobby you're doing but uh, I always like to know what's your favorite guilty pleasure film to watch. Oh, we just watched it two nights ago. My cousin Vinny. What are oh, you nuts? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we just watched it. Maris uh, uh, Tomei is amazing. Yeah, and uh, 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 as is Joe Pesci. But that's a guilty pleasure because I think a lot of people think that's lowbrow, you know, know filmmaking. Great. Ah, it's my go-to fun film for sure <laughs> oh, fantastic well thank you so much for letting us uh, interview and taking everyone's questions um for those watching next week we're going to have bruce logan who did the um miniature work for the original star wars 2001 a space odyssey and has done cinematography work um throughout the 80s and 90s uh join us at 2 p.m eastern time 11 a.m pst to ask him questions thanks again eugene and Gordon, always a pleasure to be with you and uh, yes. stay safe. Oh, you know what? I do have one question, actually. Okay. Um, what would you say, uh, for those who are still watching, um, people would get from your course that we shot together? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's worth 99 bucks, uh, definitely, uh, in this day and age. Uh, I think uh, if I had that information... Uh, when I was starting out, I think I, it would have changed how I went about, you know, developing some ideas. Uh, definitely, um, it's, it's worth to, uh, hear, you know, how major motion pictures, you know, the, how, how the sound process develops through that. I, I definitely, uh, think that, uh, you, people would appreciate it. Uh, on that level it's not very tutorial it's not going to show you what buttons to press but uh you know how to press those buttons already guys so it's now it's you know hear an old guy talk yeah it's the art (laughs) thanks thanks so much and for those watching join me next week for bruce logan have a good week have a cheers thanks